Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Special Education and the Arts webinar. My name is Adelaide Kuhn and I am Program Director at the California Alliance for Arts Education. It is a pleasure to be gathering together with all of you and our, uh, our wonderful panelists to discuss this important topic today. This event is co-hosted by the California Alliance for Arts Education, PS Arts, and the California State PTA. Chantal, you can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. So as we all get settled, please introduce yourself in the chat. You can put your name, your affiliation. Um, we'd love to know how you're doing today if you want to share that. So please take a moment to do that while I continue with our introduction. Can, great, thank you, Chantal. So I'd like to, to mention today that we have Spanish language interpretation available for the web webinar. So if you look at the bottom um, control panel on, on your screen, you'll see an interpretation button and um, you'll select your language there. I'm actually gonna hand things over to one of our interpreters, Heidi, who's going to give you some more information about how exactly to, um, to access, that, access that functionality. So go ahead, Heidi. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Heidi Avoites. I'm an interpreter here. Um, once the interpreting feature is assigned on your screen, you will see a globe and the globe will be at the bottom part of your screen. And you have to select that. And that would happen once the interpretation has been assigned. It's not assigned yet. Um, once you see it, please click on the globe icon and click on the language that you want to hear the webinar on. We have Spanish or English. Make sure you turn off your original audio. I will repeat the same instructions in Spanish. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Heidi. Estamos aquí para dar interpretación simultánea. Favor de ver en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccionar en el icono de una forma de un globo para poder llegar a, a seleccionar el idioma inglés o español. Y por favor, apague el audio original para mantenerse en el, en el idioma español y escuché toda la presentación simultánea. Gracias. Thank you so much, Heidi. Really appreciate that explanation. Um, if you have any questions or if you're having any issues with the interpretation, please send me a message via, um, via the chat feature of Zoom. Great. Chantal, you can advance to the next slide. So I just wanna, um, I wanna say thank you to Sol uh, and Heidi for the your interpretation in, in Spanish language. I also wanna welcome our two American Sign Language interpreters. We have Juanita and Kelly with us today. So thank you both for being here. We are happy to have you with us. Great, thanks Chantal. So I, I would like to open our discussion today with an acknowledgement of the land we stand on. Land acknowledgement is an important element of reckoning with our collective past, and it is a way to shift power by remembering and honoring the historical violence and oppression of colonialism. I am joining our conversation today from Los Angeles, California, the unceded territory of the Tongva people. And I now invite you to share an acknowledgement of the land that you stand on in this moment. You'll see on this slide, there are two ways to access the to a tool called native land, which maps indigenous territories, treaties and languages. And this, you can use this tool either way of accessing it via text or the website. Um, you can use this tool to identify the tribes who have stewarded the land that you are on in this moment. And again, I welcome you to share your acknowledgement of the land in the chat box. I'll give you a moment to do that.
Thank you for sharing your acknowledgements. In closing, I would like to encourage every participant to take action to stand in solidarity with Native, Indigenous, and First Nations people, and to actively disrupt structures of oppression that reproduce ongoing relations of violence and power. Chantal, you can, oh, perfect. Before we, um, I, before we get going, I'd like to just quickly run through um, our agenda that we have today, just so you have an idea what the next um, 90 minutes or so, 85 minutes um, will hold. So first, we will start with a, a national research perspective, then we'll move into a discussion of the PS Arts California Alliance Research Project. We will then have a break that Heather will lead us in a movement break. And then we, the second half, we have a panel discussion and an activity, a group activity, and we will close with Q&A. So a note on, on Q&A, you can use the um, Q&A feature on Zoom. You can also put questions in the chat. We will, I will be monitoring that and I can, I'll pull your questions and hopefully we'll get to, we'll get to as many as we can in the last 10, 15 minutes of the webinar. Fantastic. So let's, um, Chantal, if you can stop sharing for a moment and we'll take a little bit of time to, um, to introduce our speakers. Again, I'm Adelaide Kuhn. I'm program director at the California Alliance for Arts Education. And I would like to pass it to Heather to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Heather Stockton. My pronouns are she and they. I am a dance teaching artist with Luna Dance Institute. I, dance education nonprofit based in Berkeley, California, with a mission to bring creativity, community, and equity to every child's life through the art of dance. I am currently teaching at Grass Valley Elementary uh, within Oakland Unified School District. I'm teaching special ed and inclusion. I'm gonna pass it to Marilyn. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Marilyn Cachola Lucy, and I am here on behalf of the California State PTA. I am its diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, chair. I'm also here as a parent of two wonderful young men who are neurodiverse, and I am a former public school special educator, have a graduate degree in special education with a focus on early intervention and family and school systems. And I've worked as a special education advocate as well. And I'm very happy to be here. I am a lifelong dancer. So that is my art language. And now I would like to pass it to Kristen. Hey, thank you. Um, I think we have some similar backgrounds. I am uh, Kristen Paglia. I am here representing PS Arts, uh, which is an arts organization serving about 25,000 public school students in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles County in Central California. Uh, my life before, I've been at PS Arts, I think 13 or 14 years, but my life prior to that, I was a professional dancer and then dance therapist, uh, working mainly with incarcerated adults and then also working in the Paramount School District as a special education teacher uh, who used dance in my classroom. So that's my, that's my interest in background here. Andrea, would you go next? Sorry. I know I'm supposed to, I forgot. And I'm going to go to uh, Andrea Kittleson. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Kristen. So my name is Andrea Kittleson. I um, was a teacher for 21 years, seven years elementary school in Oakland, seven years middle school, seven years high school, and then an administrator in uh, South LA and then the juvenile court schools. I worked with incarcerated youth at LA County Office of Ed. Um, for a few years before coming to Walgrove Elementary. I'm here to represent Walgrove Elementary in the Venice uh, community of schools at LA Unified. Um, and so I'm super happy to be here and thank you so much. Oh, and I also, I have an MFA in theater. I used to have a theater company in San Francisco. Theater is my, uh, would you say love language or arts language? Yes. And uh, so any hoodle, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. And I'm gonna pass it on to Adam. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Davis. I go by he, him pronouns. And I'm a new, I'm the newest member of the Alliance's Arts Now program team as the program manager. 
And outside of the Alliance, I'm also a special education teacher at a charter school based in Los Angeles, California, with specialization in literacy and mathematics. I also serve as a teaching artist, as a photographer. I've been making images for almost 10 years now, and it's my art language as well as my love language, I suppose. But it's definitely something that um, I'm excited to talk about and get to share certain ideas as the moderator for this webinar as well later on. I would like to pass it to Rekha. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rekha Rajan. I am currently a associate professor for an online uh, master's program in grant writing with Concordia University Chicago, born and raised Chicago girl, but moved out to California three years ago and um, living the Cali life in Sacramento and loving the arts education community that I was totally welcomed into with open arms. Um, I've written several books on arts education, arts integration. I'm also a children's book writer with Scholastic, um, writing STEM STEAM books to keep that um, education going all the way from pre-K up into higher ed and have been doing research with various arts organizations across the country um, to help show how impactful the arts are in schools um, and helping non-for-profits to be able to do evaluation and research. And that's my role with PS Arts in this project. Um, who else do I need to pass it on to? Or was Chantal? it take back for last? <laughs> Chantal? Shan yeah, Chantal, would you introduce yourself? Of course. Hi, my name is Chantal Santoyo, and I'm the administrative assistant here at the California Alliance for Arts Education. And I'm going to be running tough for y'all. So I hope, hope things go smoothly. Thank you for joining everyone. Yeah, Chantal definitely has the hardest job today. All right. And speaking of that, Chantal, um, would you launch our first poll? So we've just all introduced ourselves. We'd love to know more about who is joining us on this webinar. So please um, take a moment to to respond to this poll. Um, we're just wondering how you connect to special education and the arts. Just take a moment and Chantal, you let me know once you've published it for everybody to see. Just go ahead and read the options here for anyone who needs it. Teacher, teaching artist, behavior intervention specialist, school therapist, parent, student, administrator, community member, arts provider, and other. And apologies if we haven't, if you're falling into the other group and we haven't provided a, an, an opportunity for you to identify yourselves. Apologies there, but all right. We have about 90% people of people have voted, 91, so we're almost there. That sounds good, Chantal. Why don't you go Sorry. ahead and perfect. Okay, since I know we have some people on the phone too. There we go. Wonderful. Okay, a nice mix with the largest group being teachers. We have teach we have we have everybody today, a little bit of everything. Teacher, teaching artist behavior intervention specialist, school therapist, parent, student, administrator, community member, arts provider, and quite a few other as well. So thank you so much. That's really helpful to, to know who's on our, on our call today. All right. Well, Reka, I'm going to pass things over to you um, to kick us off. So yes, again, welcome, everyone. I think... Um, wow, we just are always taking a collective deep breath that we're still around and being able to provide the arts and experience the arts. And that's what I wanted to start with because really you're not alone in this battle. And it feels, I think, as my background is opera and musical theater. And I always joke that um, we were always prepared to self-quarantine because we were sitting in those practice rooms for hours and hours by ourselves. and learned what it was like to just surround yourself with closed doors and windows, but it's different now um, to be separated from the people that we love, from our students, from our colleagues. And so I want to really acknowledge that the biggest trend in research right now is a shift in our mindset. It's a shift in our teaching strategies. 
and an acknowledgement that it's okay that what we were doing all the time isn't going to be appropriate anymore. Or an acknowledgement that what we were doing was great, but how do we turn that to meet the needs um, of all of our learners? Um, can we go to the next slide? So with that, um, I have, there, there's links that are embedded um, that I didn't want to open now, but there are, the national funders are, are constantly trying to support national arts organizations that then trickle down to state agencies, then trickle down to your local district. And there are funds available. And what's been really frustrating for me to see, especially leading a grant writing graduate degree is, you can have all of these funds available, but if a district or program or organization doesn't know it's there, how do they even apply for it? So you will see that there are links where we can put them in the chat um, or you can reach out and find those, but there are funds available to help get you those musical instruments, get you those art supplies, get you the resources you need to support students um, who need just that extra Chromebook or something tangible in their hand. Um, I always talk about the fact that just because we do give a Chromebook to our students or just because we give them art supplies, it's not enough. What are we doing? Um, how do we continue that engagement? And that is just universal, not just within the United States, but all across the world. And that piece with the mental shift in our teaching strategies um, also trickles down to the next slide, which is the impact on teachers. Um, my mom was a teacher for 30 years and that's how I got into the profession. She was a Montessori teacher and I was performing on stage and she said, you have to come into my classroom and help me do music and drama with my students. And it was a different world then, but the impact on teachers has been just horrendous. It's, it's do we wanna go back in the classroom? When can we go back in the classroom? What's appropriate? And then how do we continue to meet the needs of those students who, we're shy, who are quiet, who have special needs, the ones in our inclusive classrooms, what do we do? I am also the editor for a journal through the National Association for Music Education. And the number one thing I get all the time is a music teacher emailing me and saying, I lost my job. What do I do? How do I go back into this profession? Where are my resources? And so there are of course, these funding agencies, there are wonderful conferences, that have been great, they've all turned virtual, but it's that collaboration piece as well. And this ties into how much social emotional learning and our social emotional development has been highlighted in the past year. It's not just the social emotional needs of our students, it's the social emotional needs of our teachers. And we cannot ignore that. So I always tell them when I reach back to them, who was your support system before? Where was your collaboration? I have arts teachers and specialists who are now going back and creating studios, virtual studios, because they lost their face-to-face -face classroom positions. What professional development do you need? Um, I think I used to love, love, love going to national conferences because I could perhaps visit Amsterdam or go to Florida or even visit California for the first time but we don't have those opportunities anymore for that face-to-face. -face. What we do have and what our organizations that everybody's identifying with your arts discipline that's your love discipline, they're still having these conferences and they're modifying those professional opportunities for you to be able to still engage. And I think if there's anything to not lose sight of that. Can we go to the next slide? Um, this is Suzanne the main purpose of what our research project was. And I think there's this underlying assumption always that the arts support social emotional needs. Okay, what does that look like now? There's also this assumption that because of COVID, we've had arts education fall through the cracks. We've had our students with special needs fall through the cracks. We've had our students of color fall through the cracks. Is that an assumption? Or is it the reality? And what are we going to do about that? What have we done about that? And what can we do about that? The number one thing is access, right? How can you teach music 
virtually if your students don't have access to those instruments? How can you support inclusive education if you don't have the one-on-one -on -one dynamic that those students were used to? There is a real importance now for us to recognize that Research is happening. 10 years from now, somebody's gonna come back and say, oh, it was a pandemic. They just ignored their students, whatever. That's actually not what the research shows. Every teacher in every discipline is shifting their mindset, adapting their strategies. It's not easy, but, and it's not, there's no continuous equitable way. But what I'm hoping that we can share with our research is that it's something that can be taught. It's not something that's just a gift and you're a great teacher and you're wonderful. You might be, but there are strategies that we can work through in collaboration and through professional development to help reach our students through not just the ones that need have special needs, not just the ones who are lacking arts education, but in general, these are things that can be taught. Can we go to the next slide? So our research project, which I'm just going to do a setup before I turn it over to Christy, um, had a very different focus. And it was focused on understanding the ways and strategies in which we could support students with special needs in really fostering and augmenting their social communication skills. And we were so excited to be funded and supported by the California Arts Council, a great two-year project. We were going to be in the classroom every day doing observations, collecting data, and then COVID hit, and we weren't able to really do any of that. But again, there is an opportunity to see what are those teaching strategies that can still support those students. How is the student that really thrived face-to-face -face dealing with talking to a computer? How is the student that felt alienated in a face-to-face -face setting amongst their peers perhaps thriving behind a computer. And what does that look like? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christy to talk about our project. Thank you so much. Uh, and please uh, feel free to jump in if, you, if I'm, as I miss things or, or don't miss things. Um, and yet we can advance to the next slide, Chantal, thank you. Um, oh, it looks like my little website there got cut off, but I can send that out in the chat. As, as well. Um, so a little more context. We, uh, I think maybe three years ago, uh, Dr. Rajan and I and members of the California, uh, California Alliance for Arts Education and uh, representatives from the California Department of Education formed a task force. And what we were interested in the time at the time was kind of a convergence of both um, lack of access and lack of inclusion for students with disabilities, which has a, an overlapping effect in the racial equity area as well uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, of, one of which is, is pragmatic and has to do with systemic racism and the fact that um, students that students of color are highly disproportionately referred to special education classrooms. And uh, and often don't you know receive the resources and support that they need, um, and then the other piece of that is relational. That in the same way that teachers are learning more about cultural responsi responsivity and how to form relationships that are kind of outside of your of your mindset or outside of your cultural background or outside of your way of sort of relating with people in the world. This is, um, this is very true and has always been true in the disabilities space. So what every uh, parent of a child with a disability knows, what every uh, teacher, a special education teacher knows, is that you have to think about how you form relationships um, almost uniquely down to the child. Uh, there's a very famous example um, of early work with students with autism around, and that was my specialty way back in the day, uh, I was working in dance and autism and the example was around movement. So the looking, working with nonverbal students, for example, uh, I, there's a, a teacher and, and I can't remember what school it is. It's part of a documentary, but there's a teacher who's, who's 
you know, frustrated and saying to her supervisor, uh, I cannot get this kid to talk to me. She won't look at me. She won't have anything to do with me. All she does is sit on the ground and spin plates. And the supervisor said to her, then get on the ground and spin some plates. <laughs> and that is, to me, that was a really important opening into the idea of why the arts are a language through which we can communicate in a really different way. So we had already had this on our mind. California has uh, one of the highest populations in uh, in the country of students that have that receive special needs or special education services. There is a huge range from uh, from neurodiversity, from spectrum disorders, from communication disorders, from you know invisible learning disabilities, all the way to really severe medical and uh, ambulatory disabilities that, um, that may or may not um, influence the way students learn at all. So, and they're all kind of put in the same pot and said that here's special education, figure out how to do it. So this is how the arts has emerged as such an important platform. Um, something else that occurred to us at the time, although not the reason that we, that we uh, took on this, this research project was that artists and teaching artists by extension have a I think unique ability to interpret signals that may not be um, so familiar or to really work at a relationship. They, they are used to thinking in colors or sounds or movements or you know nonverbal ways they are used to really looking and observing and listening and trying to make sense of the world and i think that this piece is really key to the transformation that happened in this research so as uh reka had said and you can go to the next slide please if you if you want to um we'll get to the schools but as as reka said the um Originally, we thought we want to look at what the arts do, what theater arts and visual arts do in particular, in terms of in inclusive classrooms, not just for students with uh, disabilities, but in terms of supporting social emotional learning and development and communication development with students without disabilities in creating more inclusive spaces. So really teaching everyone this more kind of flexible way of relating to the world. And then a, a pandemic, global pandemic and school shutdown. And on top of that, massive civil unrest and uh, the murder of George Floyd and everything really changed in terms of not just our ability to collect data um, as Reka had, had mentioned, but also both as parents and as educators, a, a sense of urgency about well-being and okayness among our student populations, um, particularly for marginalized students. So this, again, extends very much into the disability space, but also all inclusion and equity um, that we really as educators had this daunting task of not being able to see or touch or communicate directly with our students, but to have this, this interface with many, many, many obstacles in the way, and not the least of which for the arts community was this idea that our, the thing that makes art teachers so unique in this ability to form relationships has quite a lot to do with kind of an empathic face-to-face -face interaction. So how is that going to look now through the computer screen, or at least this is what we felt and thought it, as a community or, or what I gleaned from my teaching artists in, in our community. So very quickly, we, we looked at this research project and said, I'm not sure that it makes sense to compare, we had collected about a year's worth of data on the students, said, I'm not sure it really makes sense to collect the data on the students now, a year later, comparing their social emotional development when this huge disruption has happened. It's, it's not going to give us, it, at, the, at best it's going to tell us that disruption is bad for kids and hard and their social emotional learning has been, um, has been interrupted. And we kind of could figure that out without a $50,000 research grant. 
So we instead started thinking about, well, A, what can we do during this difficult time to really reinforce how to teach in a virtual environment in a way that supports inclusion, in a way that supports equity, in a way that supports relationship building and social emotional learning. And on top of that, what can we learn that even when we're back in the classroom and we are face to face, how do we continue with that mindset? What are the relationship building and social emotional learning support skills that we didn't know about before because we were all in a rut with doing things the same way in, in teaching. Not all, some. Um, and so these are the two schools we were looking at. I put this up here only to show that they are largely reflective of, you know, they're very different schools, but, uh, but uh, pretty similar in terms of California overall. Um, school B being more reflective of what most of California schools look like. Um, and then the thing to note too, in the special education enrollment populations, school A had a very, very high degree of like more than average of students that have autism spectrum disorders or social communication disorders. And so this became very interesting in terms of the specific research. School B has a lower percentage of overall special education students, but these are all uh, kids with moderate to severe disability. So these are kids that are medically fragile. These are kids that, um, you know, that may have, you know, that may be, so we're also dealing with, with uh, vision impaired and, and kids that really are, um, really could potentially be at a huge disadvantage in a virtual setting. Uh, many of them have one-on-ones. Um, the school B also has a, a program where they, they pair students uh, with disabilities with their non-disabled peers to work together, especially in art class and in some of the other classes. And obviously that would not be able to happen either. So this school was very much founded on this kind of idea of communal relationship building. School A, very, very successful at inclusion, fully included classes, and largely that inclusion happened through a, um, a wonderful theater program. School B was visual arts. So it's different disciplines, somewhat different populations of students. And what we wanted to know originally was let, maybe we can untangle some things about all of those variables. We can advance to the next slide. What we ended up untangling um, more is good teaching is good teaching. That's the way that I could best put it, that there were actually, as we all went into this kind of crisis mode, we had these two teaching artists that uh, that stepped up and were able to really, um, really adapt their teaching methods for the virtual environment, which in turn also helped them think about how they will adapt their teaching methods so that they can be more inclusive and they can be more culturally relevant and more um, relevant in terms of all students learning. So, and two different arts disciplines, different ages, different approaches, different races, these are really different teachers. But what we learned, we, we first asked them to do a, uh, a self-assessment of their emotion, social emotional teaching competencies. Um, and that's what you see here. That website is, you can actually give yourself if you're a teacher, you can, this is a part of a whole learning kit. So you can do the social emotional assessment on yourself. And then there are steps for you to be able to develop those skills through the American um, uh, Institute on Research. Um, but the, what we learned is, wow, there's a lot of similarities in how they conceptualize themselves, how they assess their skills and where they, and how accurate they were. That's the other thing that uh, not all people, teacher, not teacher, disabled, not disabled, we're not especially good necessarily at reflecting on where our skills and weaknesses are when it comes to social emotional competencies. So, but they, because we compared this against assessments of them conducted by observers, outside observers, we found that they were quite, um, similar on that, even from the beginning. So this, uh, this particular uh, slide here, uh, Dr. Rajan um, took the whole assessment, the whole assessment instrument and kind of identified where in it 
are their really overlap with arts teaching in particular. So this is a, an instrument that's maybe, I think 30 or 40 items total. And these are our places where we could have identified in other research that there should be an overlap with what we typically see in arts classrooms and teaching artists being able to do. So kind of to be able to look at this and understand it. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting and important, and by the way, I will call the attention down to, I let my students know it's okay to get answers wrong or think outside the box. That to me speaks to what I was saying earlier about this ability to be flexible, to look for meaning, to encourage students to explore and express themselves and to not sort of put themselves in a, in a, a box where their performance, where their value, where their normalcy is dependent on somebody else's idea of what that is supposed to look like. Um, and here's the surprising thing, and we can go to the next slide and then I'll be, I'll be done. But the, um, do we have one more slide, Chantal? I think so. Um, here's the, the surprising thing. So both Frank and I expected that our teachers would take the self-assessment and that they would score whatever they scored and that they would then a year later, after being totally virtual, so they took the self-assessment prior to virtual. We thought after they had been totally virtual, they would actually score themselves lower. So we were, we, were, we were kind of expecting that like, oh, in the virtual environment, I'm not good at any of this stuff anymore. Well, that turned out not to be the case, which was really fascinating. And so uh, what we learned is that this mindset that these teaching artists had of, I, I am going to create relationship I am going to connect with my students. I am going to find whatever way works for whatever child in my art class. When they reported back on what they had learned, this is what came through, this kind of flexibility about that. On top of that, some other things happened. Um, PS Arts, of course, and, and these are all both PS Arts teachers, we became, very invested in teaching our, our, and working with our teachers and doing professional development specifically around relationship building in a virtual space, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that we include both disabilities and uh, race and gender and um, other identity um, in that. So our teaching artists really had this at top of mind that this is the work that they were being trained to do. Um, and I think the other piece that's really important is that I, I went in early in the pandemic and I'm going to, to, um, to turn this over in a, in a second, but I, I went early in the pandemic and talked to the principal of one of these schools and said, I, um, I don't know what we're gonna do about this research. We can't really record kids anymore. It feels invasive. There in are so many obstacles. And she said to me, and I'll, I'll let her tell the story, but, but essentially said to me, well, you know, I've noticed some things since I've been taking a look at this and, and maybe this is a good opportunity to stop, in essence, pathologizing students and asking ourselves, how do we make students perform better and really reflect on our teaching and say to ourselves, how do we become better teachers? And she said, I wanna show you this data and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kittleson now because I want her to tell the story. <laughs> wow, um, um, I'm so engrossed in everything that you're saying, but um, so um, what I noticed upon arrival at uh, the school that I'm currently at personally, when I got there in 2018, is that um, you've all, er all heard this adage um, you know what people value by what they measure. And we say the school that I'm at says they value social emotional learning like nobody's business. We don't care about test scores. We don't care about, you know, anything other than social emotional learning. And I was like, well, how do you know you're successful at it? And one of our really active parents said, well, I don't know. It's just a magical cocktail. And, um, and I thought, well, we really need to find a way to measure social emotional learning 
we give the CASP in math, we give it in English, but we don't have an assessment for students in social emotional learning. So I created an assessment. Um, I don't know if you want to share it now or if you want me to talk more about it afterwards, but um, I did put it on the, maybe you could share it now. It's in the- I, um, I just dropped the link in the chat okay. so everyone can open it up. Okay. If you open up the link, um, it basically is a way, and I'm going to refer to it. So it's a way for students to assess themselves in self-regulation, self-advocacy, peer advocacy, collaboration, conflict resolution, empathy, and then after the teacher does the same, then the scores are compared for self-awareness. And then there's a formula to arrive at a score. And I did some, and I, I write in the blog this 10 steps that we took to arrive at the spot where we had a score and, and what we did with that information. So I wanted to take a student in our school that was always in trouble. Um, teachers left and right were referring the student to the office. And I'm the principal, so I receive the students and I get a feel for who is always in trouble, right? And this one African-American boy, um, earned a score of 66 on the social emotional assessment, which is um, just slightly below average, but a pretty decent score for the, for the pre. And so then I noticed, I looked him up in the database. And for those of you educators who have MISIS or ARIES or PowerSchool or IQ or Zangle or any of those databases where they store student discipline information, you'll probably know that across the country, the only way people really measure a, a school's ability to meet the needs of, of students social emotionally is through their referrals. How many office referrals do they have? How many times are they suspended? I mean, there's no real good measure because all that is cherry picked. It's not all students all the time. It's some students some of the time. So I looked up this student who had a score of 66, the average was 71, and he had 95 write-ups and he was in third grade and he had 95 office referrals. Then I took a fifth grade white girl who had a social emotional score of 41, and which is the second lowest in the school. And in fifth grade, by the time of fifth grade, she had two write-ups. She had been referred to the office twice. And I was shocked by this. So um, I looked up one more student, you know, I looked up other students, but I wanted to bring those, the juxtapose the two of those extremes and bring it to the staff. And I didn't want to come right out and say as a brand new principal at the school, um, what are you guys doing? You're racist. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, that's not cool. I, I didn't want, you know, I'm not going to put them on the defensive like that. So I said, instead, I said, are we giving white girls a pass? Because this particular white girl had punched a girl in the stomach the day before and was not referred to the office, did not have a referral in the system, did not come to me. Um, and I brought it to the staff you know, one of those difficult conversations. But even as we continued through this work, um, when I kind of retold this story to one of our other teachers, one of our teachers, um, and I said the African-American boy's name, their emotional response was totally different than when I said the white girl's name. When I said the white girl's name, it was, oh, I love so-and-so. And I thought that, um, and the question I had is, do we relate to people who are like us? You know, are, are white women teachers gonna be more inclined to have empathy for white girl students? And um, therefore, because we have um, a dearth of African-American male teachers, are we gonna continue to exacerbate this gap and this unspoken or unconscious bias slash racism? So any hoodle, um, I, started this work and I'm gonna continue with this work because I think it's really important that we actually, in order for us to expose unconscious biases, we're gonna to have to have data on all kids, not just the ones that get referred, not just the ones that get sent to the office, but we need to have a measure for everyone. The only thing that I know of besides survey results is ACEs, right? Kids ACEs scores, but that, um, I'm hoping that there will be more assessments like ours and or ours will scale out and more people will use it so that we can really get to the bottom of um, all this stuff. Is that I just want to punctuate. Thank you so much for saying all of that. And I'm going to punctuate and then shut up. And that is 
what we discovered, one of the, the, the end of that conversation that we had was, well, what is it about these art teachers? And we really identified that it's exactly in this quote, that it is an active ability to think about your implicit biases, to think about how you are relating and to customize your teaching style. And so we, so Reka and I thought, well, let's see if we can, what we can draw from that, that we can take back in the classroom later. So this is hopefully all inclusive education, um, but uh, our focus in this particular study was on students with disabilities. Christy, I wanna add one piece to that because we're not giving the actual data because we're hoping it's gonna be published soon and we're very excited about it. But just so everyone listening understands, the teaching artists rated themselves on their own understanding of the social emotional competencies. So it's basically a self-reflective process on a scale of one to five. So five being, yes, I'm fabulous. One is, I don't know anything about this. Um, and in research, typically it's called a Likert scale or a Likert type scale. And typically what you look for is maybe a one to one change. So if someone rated themselves a two, it would go to a three. Or if they said a four, it would go to a three or a five to a four. Um, or a one to a two. What we found was extraordinary in that specific components or examples, the teaching artists went from a two to a five or a two to a four, and it was always growth or it stayed the same. There was never, what was our expectation as having done research for years that the virtual was the deficit. In fact, what we found is the virtual was a strength and being able to self-reflect, self-assess, and acknowledge that one, it's okay to change your mindset, and two, look for ways to adapt your teaching strategies. So in some ways, we were really, we spent you know weeks trying to figure out how we're gonna shift our own research project. But again, that social emotional piece, like Dr. Kittleson said, whether it's the students reflecting or the teachers reflecting or the teaching artists or administrators, or myself as a parent, um, I shared a story yesterday when we were planning my seven-year-old when all of this started in March, refuses to be on Zoom unless I sit next to him and hold his hand. So I'm not getting any work done during that time, but there's that social emotional piece. And we talked about what does that look like moving forward in schools? How do we continue to expand our own acknowledgement and reflection of what social emotional competencies are? So. I'm very excited to share that research when it's published with everyone. So then basically it's very similar to what I was talking about with students, except it's with teachers. Thank you all so much. Chantal, you can advance to the next slide. So we're now gonna move from this sort of first half talking about the research into uh, a panel discussion. But before we do that, we're gonna pass things over to Heather, who is our, our resident dancer. So of course we've asked her to do our movement breathing break. Um, so over to you, Heather, for that. All right, let's just take a couple minutes to ground ourselves in our bodies and take a deep breath. Take a deep breath into your chest or your belly, letting it rise and fall. Inhaling and exhale. And on the inhale and exhale, next time, just give your head a gentle sway side to side. And maybe you go all the way around. Remembering to focus on your breath. Nice, all right. Next time, bring your shoulders up to your ears on the inhale and really tense all of your muscles so that you can feel all of them really tensing up. And on the exhale, <sighs> drop it all. <laughs> yeah, that felt good to me. Let's try it all again. Tensing up, up, up on the inhale. Tense, 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 shoulders up to your ears and exhale to drop. <sighs> Yes. All right, now I'm gonna invite all of you to, if you're able to find a different point in this space to kind of focus on, maybe away from the screen, I'm gonna choose the window to look outside. And while focusing on that point, 
explore an opening and closing of your body. And still thinking about that, thinking of your breath, maybe with every inhale, you're opening and expanding into your distal ends. And on the exhale, you are contracting and curling into your core. I'm gonna stand up. You're also welcome to rise if you're able and take that opening and closing dance into a different direction, changing your point of focus, opening and closing. Really allowing, allowing yourself to inhale into that stretch, switching all the way out through your distal lens and expanding and contracting. And on the last closing, on the last contraction, give yourself a big hug and a squeeze. Yes. Yeah, and let's shift to a little bit of a tactile exploration. Get, just give your body some loving squeezing wherever you may need it. I think I need it in the back of my neck today. <laughs> yeah. And maybe pat it out a little bit. The last thing that we'll do is just give yourself a good shake. Let's, let's kind of enable the vestibular to do its thing, get ourselves a little bit off balance and dizzy, shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. Shake, 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 shake your head, your shoulders, your body part, all your different body parts. And find the stillness and let's all just take one last breath before we move on to the panel. Thank you. That was phenomenal, Heather. Thank you so much. I was not expecting to have my blood rushing like that during an online Zoom panel. So thank you. That was amazing. I hope everyone in attendance was able to get out of their seat or get their body moving a little bit during that exercise so that we can get right into the engaging conversation to follow. Before we get started, I did want to address, and I know it was brought up earlier, the diverse experiences of our neurodiverse friends during this time, and that we have such an amazing panel of people as well as the attendees to share out their experiences during this time. We have an opportunity to have a Google form for everyone in attendance to share some of their own insights, experiences, strategies, and ideas, including activity and lesson plans as well that I'll be asking of the panelists. So feel free to share out that information as you see fit. We'll definitely have an opportunity to share that information to all the attendees as well as the recorded session too. So to get started, I definitely want to start with Heather because your expertise, I'm sure maybe, maybe not has been drastically shifted in this time. I wanted to start with asking you how has children that you teach, how has your school's teaching changed in the past 10 months or so? This is the question, isn't it? <laughs> well, you know, there's the obvious kind of change where we're not sharing a physical space. We're not dancing together in the same environment. We're not breathing the same air, sweating together and seeing each other's three-dimensional bodies in space. And as a dance teaching artist, I am able to pick up on nonverbal cues throughout the periphery of my class in that physical space. And so shifting to teaching virtually and um, on Zoom, I have to really think about what are the different cues now, like changing up the cues. What am I like, how am I sensing my students and what their needs are in that moment? And I've really had to re-examine all of my overall teaching goals and expectations to be as responsive as I can be in every class. I think that um, Kristen, are, I think that you were all mentioning this, that what it really comes down to is good teaching is good teaching and bringing it back to what are my overarching values and goals and value um, as a teacher. Uh, I think that it's important to say that each class is different and that there's multiple variables coming into each Zoom class that I'm not aware of. So checking my assumptions and acknowledging that what I see is in the screen and I have no idea what's going on outside of the screen and how the, how my students are showing up. So kind of placing um, precedence on the fact that they're showing up is 
very important to me. And also um, think going over my perceived ideas of participation and engagement, like some students may show up and decide to observe and that's okay with me. Some students may choose to have their screens off the whole time. That's okay with me because they're communicating something to me. It's all information that I will then take and observe and reflect on my own. And um, it's just, I think with transitioning to this virtual space, it's the information may look different. The communication may look different, but it's, it's all information at the end of the day to take into uh, my reflection. And to realize that even if their screens are off, that's a choice that they're making and there's agency in that choice and they're choosing when to be seen. Thanks for sharing. I'd love to open the floor to anyone else who'd like to add to that. Um, how this experience during the pandemic has shifted the way things have been taught over the past 10 months. I'll, I'll chime in. So as a parent, you know, for me, I think this distance learning is difficult. It's very contrived, you know, and I'm always a very person based kind of relator. And this is going to be controversial. You can quote me. But, you know, for this time, this last year, honestly, instead of trying to focus on maintaining what we've been doing and shifting it to a different venue, wouldn't it have been better if we just said, hey, you know what, this is something we have to deal with. Let's take a break. Let's hit pause. And instead of continuing with that academic trajectory, let's take a pause and find a way for us to connect to the parents or the older students and go inward. Think of what we could have accomplished in this time if we just said we are going to intervene and support the social emotional development during this time because it's already difficult. Instead, one year later, are we any further on our academic trajectory? By some, by some of the measures, no. But our social emotional functioning of our kids has gone, has been impacted negatively, right? And so for me as a parent and also as an, you know, a former educator, I really thought that as an organization, as, in a, as a, a field of study, as a whole body of educators, we miss the boat in really ripping off the Band-Aid and saying, we're not gonna go, we're not gonna frame what we have to do based on what we've done in the past. We've kind of missed that opportunity to do something completely different. And so that's, that's what I came away with from this period of distance learning. Well, and I would like to chime in that um, those of us here with an artist spirit, which I believe we all have, um, have been therefore compensating for that, you know, artificial construct that is sort of a continuation of what was before and striving to make it bend to the needs um, of our students and our families. And I know that my teachers at our school have been amazing in really going above and beyond to make it as personable and as interesting as and as flexible as possible. And I have many students on my own roster as the principal under independent study um, where they're allowed to go and explore and do whatever. So it does take an artist's spirit and an artist's touch to help make those adjustments. Um, but you're absolutely right on with a social emotional thing that should be foremost. We should forget about the math and the English and the this and the that until next year, you know, like whatever. Um, totally agree. I'd love to just, uh, I, I want to echo both of those things and say specifically that um, as in my experience as an arts provider, so who's not part of the public school system per se, but we work in the public school system, um, principals have unilaterally come to us and said, listen, we have a lot of things we have to deal with and everyone's freaking out about the academic but we want you to keep coming and doing, you want the teaching artists to keep working with us and please, we don't care about anything but okayness. Like 
please just focus on the social emotional learning. So that was kind of a universal feel, I think, at least, and you know, it's only 60 of however many schools are in <laughs> all of California, but that was something that, that I experienced and from parents as well, that maybe for the first time ever, um, we weren't justifying the presence of the arts based on academic performance. We were being asked to bring in the arts as an intervention for a time where kids were really, really struggling. And so that's the, the pin that I want to, we might not learn a whole lot about the virtual environment. We learned something about it. Um, but the thing that I keep coming up with is, I don't even know if it's about the virtual environment. It is about exactly this mindset shift that Marilyn and Andrea are talking about of, I need to recognize as a person in a classroom, whatever I teach, that I am teaching human beings and I am teaching people that cannot thrive and be successful and do well if they're not okay and safe and welcome and all of those things. And that has to be a priority in teacher training teaching artist training also, but I have a suspicion that teaching artists are people to learn from in this environment. And it is a unique gift that teaching artists can give to the education community as a whole. It's certainly something uh, that's come up in a number of professional development sessions as a teacher where it's kind of an unspoken thing that we all feel but still feel the need to progress because we all still care about the well-being in some way and we've it's become kind of a routine to teach no matter what um so i i definitely wanted to, to shift gears a bit and kind of get an idea of what are some of the strategies that you as panelists and i'm really interested in hearing about it and reading about it in the google forms to follow but what are some strategies that you're using to support your child or the student's engagement within the arts, specifically knowing how important the social emotional learning aspect of things during this time have. Um, I can I can start us off. So, in uh, during this pandemic, you know, one of the roles that I've played is as a special education advocate, and I've been working with some of these families for you know probably five six years. So I. I know them, I know their kids, and it's been really difficult, right? I think it's been really difficult for many of our students with disabilities for a variety of reasons. And one of the strategies that I've shared with parents is, you know, let's think about, and again, it goes back to the social emotional well being and the management of that. Let's think about the things that can help. Movement helps, you know, music helps, being outdoors helps. And some of our parents, they don't have, quote, the art um, supplies that we might need to, to, you know, for what we typically think of art. But, you know, teacher artists are fantastic at making things up on the fly and creating, right? Put them in a situation and they'll create something. And so that, that, that welcoming and that comfort with individual expression is almost like a hand and glove um, relationship with students that have disabilities who are constantly having to fit into a mold that doesn't fit them, right? Which is our, our teaching structure and our teaching system. And so a strategy is, for example, think about what you can do with, with out in nature. Art exists everywhere. That's what I always say. And I think we all agree, art exists everywhere. So if being outdoors helps social emotional well-being, what art can we create outdoors with only what we find outdoors? Right. Social emotion, movement and music. Oh, great. You know, I, I, teacher artists know these kind of things. But you know, I, I think one strategy that I, I do want to have us think about is when we're outdoors, there's so many things that you can create outdoors. Um, that is art. It might be a pile of rocks. It could be a leaf boat. It could be, you know, a flower crown, whatever it is. It could even be, you know, building uh, twigs into like a, you know, a little tent or something. But that is art too, right? That is art too. And I think this kind of loosening of what is art is what our teaching artists can help 
parents and other teachers um, remember. I love that so much. Um, I just wanted to follow up. I had a, a moment, and again, this goes back to this interpreting different things, like going outside and seeing art everywhere, seeing the potential for creativity. This is not something that everyone necessarily naturally sees. It does have to be recognized and taught and practiced. And I remember I was, this was very clear to me walking in a very, um, uh, you know, city, very city busy cars, chain link fence everywhere kind of street with my son when he was about six. And, uh, and he looked at the sun coming through a chain link fence and it was casting a pattern on the ground that looked like a, well, like a chain link fence. And he said to me, can you believe how magical this is? It looks like dragon scales. And I remember thinking like, oh, right. Like we have to teach them or they have to teach us and we have to reinforce it how to look at the world. Well, and, and we have to not squash, we have to not whack-a-mole it out of them. Right. <laughs> um, when we, um, with our own projections onto them about what learning should or should not be, what school should or should not be. And um, regarding whether or not students with special needs are doing well in this world or not, you know, not all students are the same. And some of our students, especially some with autism are flourishing in this virtual world because there's less stimu stimulus. I've had students, you know, love the technology and create stop motion animation and, and, and do all this stuff that they were too overwhelmed in the physical world to be able to do. Um, and then, of course, we have students who are the opposite and they're struggling without that interaction. Um, and this is just one more layer of the lasagna that we didn't anticipate having to consider that education is experience. It's just being in the world. And there are so many ways to be in the world. And what we really should be teaching kids is just how to acknowledge and address and react to and navigate and interact with being in the world, whether it's a classroom, whether it's a car, whether it's a scavenger hunt looking for pine cones out in the forest, whether it's this these boxes. I equate these boxes to the potted plants on my balcony because what I noticed during the three week winter vacation, actually it was before that, what I noticed um, is that my plants reach out for each other. I didn't notice that before. I didn't know that they talked to each other. And, and so I use that as a metaphor to explain to our families that just as our plants reach out to touch one another, you know, we acclimate to this pot, potted plant Zoom box world um, and find ways, you know, just like flowers push up through cracks in concrete, we find ways to build human connection in this Zoom world, some more easily than others, for sure. But I would like us to not, to, to whether it's the physical world or the Zoom world, not all special education students are a monolith. Not all gifted students are a monolith. Many, I, I consider all people to be both special ed and gifted. And it's just, a, you know, and we have to recognize that there are pros and cons to all of it. It's all just a tool. Sorry. I have to just add, that was beautiful and a great metaphor, but I have to add, um, my background's in early childhood education. And so when I started 20 years ago and we're learning about all the theorists and methodologies and approaches and Rachel Amelia and Montessori and Frabel and the reason why it's kindergarten is it's children in a garden. Where did we lose that idea of that experience and that being outdoors is what is a part of, if you've ever been in a Rachel Amelia classroom, you know, there's rocks, there's mirrors, there's plants, there's sticks. That's that something got lost. And if you're not in a specific school with that name associated with it, you don't get that. And I think right around the time someone decided arts weren't an important part of yeah, education. Exactly. And that was always <laughs> a part of every early childhood philosopher's approach, a part of every early childhood theory that I studied over 20 years ago. And then I go into a public school with my degree and I'm like, what, why are they all in rows looking at me? Like, where did I end up wrong? And so this whole experience this past year, I think for all of us and with the poll in the beginning, we didn't, there's not just one that we're gonna pick. I'm a teacher, I'm a teaching artist, I'm an artist, I'm a parent. I could have picked half of that list, right? So we've, 
all been forced to look at ourselves in the various hats we wear and realize that this is where education really started. And I think taking that positive is a very important strategy that I hope we can continue to carry on even if we're all face to face again at some point. Yes, I'm, I'm what I'm hearing from all of you is uh, showing up as our authentic selves and allowing space for our students to show up as their authentic self in whatever capacity that is today and um, allowing for emergent curriculum to come about. I'm going to be honest, sometimes I show up at class and I have a clear idea. I'm like, okay, this is these are the ideas that I want to work with. And it goes out the window because it's just not what they're there for today and their their energy is shifting into a different direction and and i for the most part in this virtual learning and, and i celebrate students kind of stepping into more of leadership and teaching roles and being seen and learning from like having them share their own movement and teaching each other movement and creating movement and seeing each other and, and describing what each other is doing and that's that's really how their relationship base is coming in and I also want to say that something that's been incredibly valuable for me as a teaching artist is having paraeducators in the classroom with me in every single class and they are they are really creating the relationships with those students and they're able to I invite them to jump in and, and say what they're observing say what they're seeing describe it you know give positive affirmation and reinforcement for how the students are creating and being in their bodies and just being present. Um, so having resources with classroom, like building those relationships with classroom teachers, paraeducators, administrators, parents, teach and families, inviting parents and families to come in and dance with them. Just realizing that we're all this, in this together and um, uh, being open and aware and authentic to what the reality is and going with it. Thank you all for sharing that. That was such a wealth of knowledge in terms of what is possible, what we want out of this experience for our students moving forward and thinking about the future as well. And kind of trying to piggyback off of a few things that were said, I wanted to hear and would be really interested to hear the kinds of activities, lessons, interactions, or any particular moments where you felt that the arts were being supported in an inclusive classroom. It feels like a lot of the time when it comes to education during this time, some students flourish, as was mentioned earlier in this environment, and other students need a bit more assistance. And figuring out the ways in which we can integrate the arts into the classroom during a digital space to support the students to succeed as best as they can. Well, can I talk about one of the theater things that are happening at our school? Absolutely. So, um, um, you know, our theater, our PS Arts theater teacher does a great job with um, making students of all levels, he, you know, teaches the kids TK to grade five and, and the, um, the kids will put on a play, right? So in the spring, they were supposed to put on a giant musical with two rotating casts of 80, so 160 kids, but it ended up being... you know, that um, the students decided themselves, some of the fifth graders, that they were going to create their own murder mystery. And they wrote a play and they performed in their own house, created these sets with caution tape and, you know, to the degree that they could. You know, we have a very diverse group of students where some are associated, not economically just because you always have virtual backgrounds if you need to, or you have, you know. Um, and so the, the students... And, and so students of all le of all skill sets are invited to participate to the degree they can, whether it's building props, acting. Um, let's say, for example, you love drawing, but you hate performing. You know, you can make a pencil puppet. You know, you can put a, your drawing on a pencil and now it's a puppet and that becomes part of the set. So there's so much, universal design for learning is always my big thing, constructivism and UDL. And um, if you just um, provide choices for kids and allow them to participate in whatever manner they want, they get to be a part of the show, then that's universal design for learning. We're all doing the same show, but we're all contributing something different. Um, and that has been really powerful. 
and our theater teacher is really good at that. I I love to just add on to to what to the idea that you just brought up of allowing space for choice making and agency. And I said earlier that some of my students prefer to have their screens off during the most rest of class. But I want to share that one time one of my students uh, very intentionally chose to turn her her screen on when it came to show her dance and she showed her dance and then she turned her screen off. <laughs> and so there's a the real agency in that action. And so the next class that I had, I decided to use the camera and the screen as a, a form of play and what is being seen. So playing with um, presence and absence and like what body parts can be seen in the screen and like peekaboo and um, towards and away and just like really getting creative with what we have. Um, yeah, and it was fun. <laughs> I wonder if, Adam, you, I knew you were a teaching artist and special education. I didn't know that you, or photography was your um, uh, medium. And I, something I've noticed is my interest as well as students' ability to use digital forms of, of art making, including in dance, which has been, you know, somewhat tricky and music, that has really, that's been a real eye-opening experience for me in terms of like being more inclusive. So I'm wondering if you have specific experiences, like if, I wonder if your experience has been different in the photography realm as a teacher or teaching artist with, uh, in the virtual environment with special education students or not. That's a great question. And it certainly has shifted how I view photography. I know the big trend when the pandemic started for a lot of artists, teaching artists that make images was the, the big FaceTime photo shoot where you'd, you'd, get a, you'd find uh, someone who'd like to sit for a portrait and they'd hop on a FaceTime call and you'd make a portrait either using screenshots or use your actual camera and trying to make the best of the situation. And it's been something where we've tried to integrate more literacy based tools, helping people learn how to use their language and writing where we typically have activities where two students or uh, four students would partner together and we get to know the student a bit better and have an opportunity to make a portrait of them in class. And now we're teaching students, hey, how can we take screenshots of, of, of our, our Zoom call and help make breakout rooms for everyone to join? And I would, we would just, my, my co-teacher and I would just pop into the, the room and just listen in on the conversation. And you'd be so surprised at the kinds of things that they're sharing between each other that they wouldn't normally share in a traditional classroom. They're in the comfort of their own homes. They know that their brother and sister or their parent or guardian is near them. They may have their cat in their lap and they have a conversation and they take notes on a digital form and they're able to just go, okay, there's someone that I may not be near them in a classroom, but we may not have had this conversation in a different space. And at the end of each of those conversations, they take, they pose, they, some, some people have set up their entire houses for like a really inclusive portrait that the other person with their partner would be taking of them or making of them. And we have presentations. We've done it twice so far this year. We've had a number of new students join in on our, our classroom. So it's been a great experience to introduce new students as well. And it's something that I do envision uh, using as a tool in the future, regardless of whether we're in person or not. It's something that I've brought to the attention of the administrators at the school that I teach at from a, a professional development standpoint, which I think would lean, lean into the, the, the last question of the, the webinar of the panel. Um, just getting into some of the, the opportunities from a professional development standpoint that educators, parents, especially teaching artists would like to see themselves being put in the position to be taught those things from a professional development standpoint so that they can bring these opportunities into the classrooms that they're in. Right. Can, um, can I mention one that is connected to what a question is in the chat, which is about, you know, one of the questions was, how do I bring art to the school that doesn't value art? Um, and this ties into what you're talking about, um, which is showing people that using the art to teach the science is more powerful than the science in and of itself. For example, if you have students write a play where the characters or the elements of the periodic table, they're gonna be much more inclined to learn the attributes of those elements than if they were to just 
wrote, memorized them and regurgitate them, right? If you know how iron and, and um, gold interact on a bench in a park, you're going to be more inclined to, to rec, you know, to remember that one of them, you know, melts at 1947 degrees Fahrenheit, but you wouldn't remember that otherwise if you just did it in a traditional way. So bringing in research and also bringing in examples of how using the arts to teach the sciences is much more powerful than using the sciences in isolation. Um, so I just wanted to I mean, throw I, that in there. Obviously, I'm on way on board with with that and then in response to to what Adam was saying too about the the digital piece or or this reconceptualization of art something that occurred to me having I also have a child who uh has a lot of um sensory integration issues and some uh some other some other things that he requires a lot of adaptive technology that's the word I've always used adaptive technology and this was something as a special education teacher, it was expensive, it was an add-on, it's something, it was an accommodation. So one thing that I think that, you know, so to tag on to what Andrea was just saying, digital arts integration in particular at this moment is a great equalizer. So you have the power of the arts and then all of a sudden you're saying, wait, we can all use adaptive technology because we're all adapting we're in quarantine we're in a medical environment where we have a limitation and so that was something to me that was really humanizing to realize like wow he's already doing this he's already doing the subtitles he's already doing the the digital pieces and thinking about the world through a digital artistic creative lens so um so maybe professional development and <clears throat> digital media and photography. <laughs> and, well, in, in arts integration and digital arts integration, I love that phrase because arts integration is something that doesn't come naturally to people. It definitely is a PD need. And digital arts integration beyond the SAMR model, which is fine, the SAMR matrix, but what you're talking about is fantastic. I love it. I can speak as a teaching artist. Um, I feel like there's a unique opportunity right now with homeschool connections to invite families into the part of learning and the play of it all. Um, as a teaching artist, I, I like to tell my teaching artist friends, don't isolate yourself, um, reach out, have conversations, connect with other teaching artists, talk about what's working, what's not working, or just vent or share. Um, I think Adelaide put some links in the chat from Luna Dance Institute where um, I'm on faculty for professional development resources. We have practitioner exchanges where we can, where it's just a space where we can all connect and just talk about what's working and what's work, not working and how we can be creative and uh, more responsive. I wanna add and just reiterate the fact that we always talk about our core academic subjects as being English and language arts and science and math. But a few years ago, the arts were mandated as a core academic subject. And until that is acknowledged and treated with the same quality and attention and purpose that we do for what was traditionally academic, we are forever going to be marginalized. And then our students who need these experiences even further marginalized. So if you wanna talk about professional development, when my earliest stages of presenting were to ask K through 12 general education teachers did you know that there are national standards for arts education? No one has ever heard of them. They would have heard of Common Core or whatever was there. Nobody knew that there were actually standards that arts educators adhere to when we design our lesson plans and the work that we do and that we have developmental phases and very purposeful strategic planning processes in addition to all of this emergent thinking, the flexible thinking. Um, so I just want to always reiterate that the arts are a core subject. And, and that's, that was a huge step for all of us um, in the field. So the more we can continue to speak that and say it, um, I think is important. Thank you all for sharing the, such an enriching conversation that I hope everyone benefited from. Um, before we wrap up the, the remainder of the panel and the, the webinar and as a whole, I did want to add the link to the Google form in the chat one more time before we pass it over to Adelaide for the Q&A portion. 
Uh, there are people sending in their responses. So uh, we do see that there are, the link is accessible. If not, please reach out privately via the chat, but I'd love to hand it over to Adelaide for the Q&A. Thanks so much, Adam. Chantal, will you share the final slide so that everyone has an email address where they can reach us for anything that comes up? Fantastic. Okay, we have some really great questions from the audience. The first is, what is the best way to introduce and propose music therapy treatment slash interventions to school administration or faculty at a school or district? I, I don't know what the best way is, but the shortest answer that I can give you as someone who does a lot of selling of arts to schools <laughs> is the best way is to show. If, there, if there's video, if, there's a, if you can invite into a, a classroom, a session, a music therapy session, et cetera, to me, that is much, much better than anything we can say or any text we can, we can um, present. Thank you, Christy. Anybody else want to hop in on that one or should I keep going? All right, I'll keep going. How do I structure arts programming for students remotely when I don't necessarily know their particular needs and abilities? Can, can I answer that one a little bit, at least from my perspective as a principal? Yeah, please. Is, um, and, and twofold, when you, um, if you employ the principles of universal design for learning, you don't need to know people's skill sets. You're providing a buffet, basically, of opportunity. And, and wherever they are, you allow them to go even higher than you could imagine anyone could go. You'd never limit people to the confines of your own personal understanding. An example is last spring, I personally taught a class called Build Your Own Utopian Planet, and it was TK to five, and any kid in the school was welcome. And we had kindergartners, third graders, you know, kids of all interests and skill sets. And they learned from each other no matter where they were. The, the only thing they were doing that was the same was building a utopian planet. But how they did it and what it looked like, totally up to them. And so the, the challenge is only the teachers in so far as you can't be stymied by your own lack of imagination or your own ego, you have to be willing to just provide an opportunity and let people run with it. So universal design from learning on a teaching standpoint, on a principal standpoint, I give as many opportunities as possible. So during virtual learning, we've maintained all of our enrichment programs. We didn't stop any of the ones that are funded by parents or that we didn't have the money for. We have PE, we have art, we have violin, we have dance, we have music, we have theater, we have our steam studio with our art, our resident artists. So even if they only have two feet, five, oh, we have our outdoor education with our garden teacher. So um, even if a small handful of people access that, it's that's the small, that's one or two more kids than would have otherwise if we just had English and math. So. Um, it's about offering as much as possible and then letting kids go as far as possible and not worrying too much about what grade they're in or what it's called. And if it, you know, because people have this fear of combo classes. My kid's in a two, three combo class. I'm so worried that they're not going to achieve. It's like you could call that class 10th grade. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's the kids. You we teach kids. We don't teach grades. We teach kids. We don't teach curriculum. We provide opportunities for them to experience the world, and then we see where they go. Thank you so much, Andrea. What a great place to end. I mean, there's so many, so much more to talk about, but. Um, Thank you for, for ending us on, on that note, Andrea. I wanna thank our panelists so much um, for all that you have brought to our conversation today. I wanna thank everyone um, who attended for your time and your participation. And I want to just one more time encourage you to fill out that Google, Google form. Um, we will be compiling all of your answers and sending that out as a follow-up along with a link to the webinar and all of the resources shared in the chat. So thank you all. And you'll see on the PowerPoint screen, there's an email address. Please feel free to send an email to that address and I will 
direct it to um, whichever panelist you, you would like to be connected with or whoever can answer your question best. Thank you all so much. Have a fantastic evening. Thank you.